Well, we have Caroline Bergvall's piece, The Knot Tail, and it's <coughs> from a book called Metal English, M-E-D-D-L-E. -E. Ron, when you hear the title, Ron and then Anna, when you hear the title Metal English without knowing anything else, what does it make you think that Bergvall is doing in this book? Anna first, then Ron? Meddling, clearly. Uh, she is playing with uh, Chaucer, who was himself uh, playing with the English language because in the London of his day, all the elites like himself, an MP, uh, spoke French. Cool. And Caroline Bergvall is very interested in playing with all of those versions of English and not English and the influences on English. So we're going to be talking about a poem called The Knot Tale, which is a rewrite, as it were, we're going to sort of figure out what kind of rewrite, of Chaucer's The Knight's Tale. So that's what we're going to do. And I'm here with Lainey, Lainey Brown. Hi, Lainey. Hello. And Ron and Monica and Liz and Anna and Julia and Tracy. All right, here we go. So Tracy, would you read the poem? And then we'll just go from there. We'll see what happens. Okay. The Knot Tale Funeral by Caroline Bergvall. The great labor of appearance served the making of the pyre. But how, nor how, how also how they shall not be told, shall not be told. Nor how the gods, nor how the beasts, and the birds, nor how the ground aghast, nor how the fire, first with straw, and then with dry, and then with grin, and then with gold, and then. Now how a site is laid like this, nor what, nor how, nor how, nor what she spec, nor what was her desire, nor what jewels, when the fire, not how some threw there and some there and there in cups full of wine and milk and blood into the fire, into the fire, nor how three times and three times with and three times how and how that, nor how, nor how, nor how nor who, I cannot tell, nor can I say, but shortly to the point, I turn and give my tale an end. Thank you, Tracy. Julia, then Monica, then Liz. Uh, can we start on all these negatives? Not, nor, all that stuff? It's doing, it's called the not tale instead of the night's tale. Julia, you first throw something out. Yeah, I mean, one thing I think of immediately is this is not a tale, this is not a story, this is not a narrative. But I also find, find myself getting stuck on, okay, wait, wait, wait a second, what's the difference between nor and not? Nor usually belongs with neither, and so what happens when we get all these nors stacked together, especially on the second page of the poem? And um, it's almost as if the lines keep turning around what they're not turning towards or what the poem is not saying because of that implied comparison with Noor. Fantastic start, thank you so much. Liz, I, wanted, I want Mon Monica to go next because I wanna ask Monica something about translation. Um, mm. But Liz, what, what's, say more about this negative stuff that's going on. It's a little weird for a tale, T-A-L-E, to be based mm. on things that aren't being said. Yeah, well I think, um, it seems to me a lot of things are going on, obviously <laughs> one, is resistance to narrative structures um, on the level of syntax and on the level of the overall form. And in this case, it's also connected with um, a kind of resistance to the very finality that is the subject matter of the poem. A funeral. A funeral and the coming to an end. So with all these uh, sort of suspended um, syntactical fragments, we are forestalling finality. Beautiful. Tracy? Um, I just noticed something. Caroline, if you hear this, that was off the cuff. Caroline sorry. watches all Modpo videos. Sorry to butcher, <laughs> uh, but I, uh, sorry to butcher this text, but I, I, I did know something maybe, 
and that is my probably flawed pronunciations of dry gren or green mm -hmm. and fire versus fire mm -hmm. because there's this you know grena maybe and dry and green and uh fire versus fire and that sort of unstressed syllable is often called a, ne a, a feminine ending so that conceptually there's this contrast between the framing of the masculine night is not feminine well, and then the presence of these feminine endings that I didn't pronounce at the first but then I'm seeing might need to be pronounced in the second reading. Wow. Okay. That there's a thematic formal harmony rhyming that we need to talk more about. So Monica, I feel this is the right moment to ask you. I mean, this is a poet who thinks about everything that she does as a kind of translation. In this case, f meddling with Middle English and really not translating it, but doing what? What is going on? What kind of translation is this? Well, it's definitely an experimental translation. It's an experiment. It's it's an experiment too with um, English to English. That first would be like, what? How do you Why translate would you English do that? to English? Why would you do that? Mm -hmm. Is that really a translation? I think what it's doing is, on one level, I mean, it's doing so much. I agree with um, everything that's been said. I mean, it's, it's, it's an incredibly rich poem, two pages, so much going on here. But I think it's reminding us that translation, one of the things that translation does is repeat an utterance. In a, it's utter something. What you translate is not, you don't translate literally. This idea of word for word, you're not translating words, you're translating utterances. And then the utterance, of course, inflects the language, gives it a particular intonation, brings orality into the mix, if you're thinking of, of utterances, and that is exactly how a language morphs and, mm -hmm. and, and evolves. And so that is why we're seeing these like palimpsests, I think, of utterances, some with Middle English that's been meddled with and some with English as we understand it now. And of course, as, um, as, as Tracy has been suggesting, Caroline is incredibly precise with her utterance and delivery of poems. And it's another turn the poem takes in her own perf oral performance of it. And it points a finger to the problem, the chasm between speaking and writing and how transcription is always problematic. Transcription, transmission, so that's, I think, one of the things that it's problematizing. And, and this idea of um, also withholding. So withholding the tale from us and canceling the information and simply calling attention to the mechanisms through which language turns, but not giving us the thing that is supposedly the, the point of the tale. That's really yeah. cool. Lainey, you and I had the great pleasure of studying Caroline Bergvall's work together and then spending a few days with Caroline. And so I'd like you to address the issue that's a cousin to translation of uh, writing through, rewriting, transcribing was a word that was just used. Can we talk about that? Because she's, she's you know, I have here a modern informal translation of this part of the tale. And it says things like, I don't want to talk about how the plants on the forest floor, I don't really want to go into how, I don't want to tell you how. And that's kind of an interesting, tra I like that translation, because that's sort of what the speech is about. Um, but this is, this is a radical version of what I just read. How so, and is it interesting, and so on. So interesting. So one thing that's coming to mind is how time works in the poem. So we have Chaucer, but then I'm also thinking about Stein a lot in the way that the it does sound like Stein, the doesn't repetition it? and what happens with the repetition. And there's a lot about three, which maybe somebody will have more to say about three. But but how nor how how also how they. So even if you just track that one word how in the very beginning, it just it slows us down. And it's so what happens in the absence of a funeral as the absence of, we're not gonna talk about it, we slow down very much until we're standing still because there is there is not, there is nothing there. We don't know what happens next. So we're in the word how, but that how isn't answered. But every repetition is a slightly different meaning, as in Stein. 
Ron and then Anna, can we talk about the Steinian quality of this? It may be, it may be just a matter of the way it sounds when Tracy reads it, or anyone reads it, nor how, nor how, nor how, nor who. Um, but I think it goes deeper than that, which was, Laney, was what Laney was suggesting. Ron and then Anna? Well, if you actually look at it on the page, and I, and I, I recommend people get the book and read the book, which is wonderful. Um, it looks like uh, a fair amount of Stein's work from the teens and into the early 20s in particular. Um, and it has that sort of attention to surface. Every time you hear the word not, uh, mm -hmm. or you hear the very slight changes between tooled and told, you're... you're getting a sense of the surface of language and the sound of language. This is the sort of thing that in Stein's own lifetime, she was often ridiculed for. Um, and, you know, because she was not searching out at levels of ambiguity and symbolism. Uh, she was, in fact, bringing to the front the surface textures of language and making you realize that they were not at all um, the simple things you presumed them to have been. Mm. And this is what Stein does at yeah. her best. So Anna, little curveball version of the question. <laughs> You've never seen any of those. Uh, you hit a curveball pretty well. Um, we probably put this video, this new video and this new poem in chapter 10 sorry, week 10 of the course, where all the Caroline Bergvall stuff is. But what if we put it with Stein mm -hmm. in week four? Would it work? How Steinian is it? I'd put it right next to the, the, the poem, that, the Stein poem that kept coming to my head was the complete portraiture of Picasso. Mm -hmm. um, the now, not now, and now, feeling full mm -hmm. for it, exactly as is Kings. Mm -hmm. I'm really reminded of that in nor how, nor what, nor how, nor how, nor what she spake nor what, like, that sounds to me so much like the completed portrait of Picasso. And what Liz was saying about the way that this poem is really resisting telling the story of the funeral, resisting telling the story, is exactly the way that the portrait of Picasso is resisting portraiture. Mm -hmm. So now we've gone from the experimental form and use of language back to theme. So this is going to be a lightning round, starting with Julia, then go to Monica. Um, your job is to explain the relationship that Caroline Berval through this poem is setting up to the Chaucer. So I would say, I would stipulate, and you can argue against the stipulation, that the ratio is not is to night as Bergval is to Chaucer. So we just heard about the king in the Stein poem. Mm -hmm. Here we have a knight. Mm -hmm. So Julia, get us started on the thematics of this resistant translation? Well, yeah, I guess, is this a thematic issue? I'm thinking about genre, which is related to form, but I, I kept, my eye keeps going to, I turn and give my tail an end, which is such a witty way to end the poem. I mm. turn, and here's a line break. And, turn tail. And ha -ha. Exactly, and I turn tail, and give my tail an end. Ta-da, here's an end. You wanted an end? Here, Here's, here's, a, here's end. the word end, which will right. end the poem, <laughs> which is not the kind of end that- So it's an ironic use so of the word end. So it's, I think it's, it's, it's really funny because it's, an, it's the, that obligatory thing that, that the genre, the Chaucerian genre demands of us and Bergwall is turning it on its head. Cool. Monica, then Tracy, the, what is, if you had to really reduce this for someone who doesn't know anything about this kind of writing, you would say, oh, here's what she's saying about the Chaucer. Well, I find that this line, nor what she spack, nor what was her desire, mm. to be very important. In very the poem. Um Thinking idea. of Stein, I would put this poem maybe next to patriarchal poetry because the funeral is the funeral in Chaucer because two men are fighting for a woman, right? There's a duel. The woman is Emily. One kills the other. We never know what she feels, right? They're, whoever wins the battle, whoever kills the other will marry Emily. We don't get to hear what Emily thinks. Her desire is not spoken. So I think the withdrawal and withholding, the withholding of information in the poem is very much also related to a feminist, feminine, a feminist critique of course, also related to the idea that feminine endings are not 
heard. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, Ma, that's, that's a good one. I like how we return to that. Tracy, Laney, and Liz, thoughts on this? Yeah, I, um, there's this interesting way in which monosyllabalism is working here. And um, I'm, I'm struck by the, the opening couplet going into these series of words. Uh, monosyllabic words and what's not left out. So be, in the reading it, of it, it gives me some information. So the, but how, nor how, how also, how they shall not be told, shall not be told, nor how the gods, nor how the beasts or beasties and the birds. And what I found is between the lines, nor how the gods, nor how the beasts and the birds is a missing word. And that word is good. Mm-hmm. I think everything leads to good, but then good is absent. And I think that negative space for good, if you will, is saying something about what the not means. So the negative space of good can turn into a different kind of good? I don't know if it's a different kind of good or if it's the absence of good, because all of the words before... But the absence of good is not bad, necessarily. No. The absence of good is... There, it, it depends. And it depends, and I think it depends on the Christian tradition and its insertion of this or not also. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, I just feel like the drive leads us to the world word, and then it's not there. Mm-hmm. And also, there's re- resonances with that word even after with words like blood. So we're hearing good without it being there. What does it mean that it's not there? It doesn't necessarily mean bad, but it means good is mm-hmm. not there. Wow. Okay, Laney, that's how I felt. Yeah. No, I, amazing. Laney, Liz, I want to change it up a little. Sorry, that's fine. I mean, fine. you're welcome I'm to fine. say what you were going to say, have but a I'm big thought. I'm All trying okay. to condense All right. it. Well, but... why why does Chaucer <laughs> use the rhetorical device of saying, "I'm not going to tell you this, nor am I going to tell you this"? This was really amazing funeral, but I'm not going to tell you about this either. I'm thinking about this mischievous, boisterous lingual play that is in just even the word not you know how one word can can have this so many meanings so many different ways it can be written from n-o-t to k-n-o-t to n-a-u-g-h-t to night with a k to night without a k and it makes me think about how um, Bergvall relates to Chaucer's work in other books as well like Allison Sings so there's this polyvocality of even this one word, not. In, in Allison Sings, a book of 2019 after this. Yeah. Um, love that. Thank you. Liz, respond to any of this stuff. Okay. Well, I've, I've kind of got three different thoughts, um, so I'll try to be super quick. Um, one is thinking about um, what you said about the not. So there's a term called paralypsis that is saying something like not to mention the heat, so you've both invoked something and negated it. Um, And so that seems like it, I mean, as a strategy, it's invoking the imagination of the reader um, as opposed to delivering uh, the material. Um, Another thought is, since you brought up Stein, um, and Tracy went to those first two lines, thinking about the great labor of appearance served the making of the pyre. I think in some ways it's about like the the burn it down aspect of modernism <laughs> post Victorianism and aestheticism like all that elaboration all that dressing all that labor toward appearance is just like being this set custom on the of the funeral mm-hmm. yeah. it's all being burned yeah burn baby burn yeah. Yeah. oh how so interesting can I say one more thing <laughs> yes okay so you're on a roll the, for sure the other thing is that the not and the nor like so. Um, one thing it's doing is drawing attention to what a single letter can do mm-hmm. in terms of um, transforming meaning and reiterating meaning. Um, but I'm really interested in how not is a refusal and how nor is a hinge. And what we end with is a conjunction, is a hinge. isn't it? Right. Yeah. So it's like there's the there's the resistance or refusal of the um, turn. Uh, that comes, the, there's the turn that comes after the refusal, mm-hmm. the pivot that is kind of how we end as well. Love it. Okay, we're going to do final thoughts. And by that, I mean simply a thought, an idea that you wanted to throw out there. Totally miscellaneous. It doesn't have to go in order. We're going to go Tracy to Laney and then back to me for a final thought. 
and you can skip if you're not ready. Okay. Oh, am I first? Yeah, oh, if okay. you want to be. Well, just piggybacking off what Liz says, the, the missing letter is K, right? It's the K and not and the K and night. Yes. And um, it's also the manipulation of O in the double and in the singular. And I wonder what, if there's some sort of relationship with, uh, because these, these old school folks were really into it, <laughs> like the numeric, the numericization of the letter, like it, the elevenness of the K, you know, and the, um, what is that, 15th, the 15ness of the O, um, or the double of it. I, I just wonder if there's some sort of numerical reference that this um, that's embedded in this poem. I, I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. Mm -hmm. I also wonder, because Carolyn speaks uh, several languages, if the, if the letter K l written is present in all of those languages and if she's making a meta sort of alphabetic mm. commentary with the presence and absence. Yeah, that Liz which is, is something she about. likes to do elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Julia, final thought? Um, well, I love what Tracy just said, and it, it, that um, remark and many of the other remarks here have pointed to the very finely wrought nature of this poem, very, very um, discreetly crafted nature of the poem. And there's also something that I notice about the way it unfolds and kind of seems to self-correct and do the translation work in real time and be figuring it out on the page. And I love that apparent contradiction of being both finely wrought and feeling a little improvisational. And it makes me think of what Monica said about a translation uh, doing the work of how language itself is morphing, always morphing and changing. Fabulous, thank you. Anna? I'm wondering uh, to what extent this poem is perhaps participating in another uh, Mod Po lineage of sorts, which is that of the experimental elegy. Um, and I say that because I love how long it takes us for it to get to the speaker. It's like the last right. five lines before the speaker <laughs> arrives. Um, the idea that the speaker, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think of in this particular part of the knight's tale, it's actually the knight who's dying, who's telling this whole part. Is that right? It's our site? I yeah, it's our site speech. It's our site speech, speech, isn't it? Right? Okay, yeah. so our site is the knight who actually dies. So he's kind of mm -hmm. actually giving his own... Uh, kind of final statement, his own kind of final elegy. Give my tail an end. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where I am. Um, and I love this as, as sort of participating in that, in that um, particularly Mon Po tradition of the experimental elegy. Um, my tail is going to end when it ends, and it's just going to be when I die. Mm -hmm. So the knot there is a refusal to do it the yeah. regular old way. If I keep talking, maybe I won't. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Very, that's right. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's almost Bacchetti. Right. right. If I keep concept. refusing to do this, yeah. I might have a little longer. The little squeaky voice keeps things alive. Uh, Liz. Yeah, I was thinking about the same two lines, I cannot tell nor can I say, and how something that appears to be simply reiterative is actually draws our attention to the difference between the two items that seem to be same. Um, telling is different from saying. Mm -hmm. um, telling is the space of the tale. Saying is mm -hmm. this utterance outside of telling. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So she, Caroline is pro saying <laughs> and skeptical of telling, something like that. <laughs> Monica, final thought? Uh, just three very quick things. One, how it really um, enacts this idea of translation as language turning. Mm -hmm. um, then what is not in the poem, in almost all the lines, happens to be verbs, mm -hmm. with the exception of some nouns. The nouns stay in the poem. So how that also enacts this idea of finality, right? Like the action is canceled, stopped. Nouns remain. And then I love nor how, nor who, and how how and who are just a transposition, mm -hmm. same letters. Mm -hmm. So again, the turning, how them, the, 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 the strategy emphasizes this notion of turning. Very cool, thank mm -hmm. you. Ron? It takes me actually back to the original 
um, arguments and disagreements out of which English itself is created. Uh, Chaucer's English um, was not the same as the Gawain poet, though they were writing at the same time in different parts of England, they almost are writing in different languages. Yeah. Um, and as, as I said before, Chaucer was writing in a language that he was not speaking on an everyday basis in London. Um, and I'm reminded of this also in part because when I was going to school many decades ago, closer to Chaucer's time, <laughs> um, there was a real debate about whether or not Chaucer or Spencer um, would be kept in the curriculum. And when I was at Berkeley, they made a decision to keep Chaucer and the Spencer professor committed suicide. Um, so these are not inconsequential phenomena in, in terms of people's lives. And the, the one last thought is that Michael McClure could do the entire general prologue at the drop of a hat and would if you gave him the slightest provocation. <laughs> I remember the last waltz, the band's final concert, McClure yes. came out and recited Chaucer mm, right. there, and the crowd was a little confused. <laughs> but it was a great moment. And I'm sure Robbie Robertson had been reading Middle English the entire time. Lainey, final thought. I'm going to also turn to the end. I cannot tell, nor can I say, but shortly to the point, I turn and give my tale an end. Another way to read that would be that the end and the tale are being told, but they're not being told here. So we have the fire, which is like the spectacle, but the tale and the end of the tale are being written alongside this text, but we don't get it. It's yeah. invisible to us. It's in the smoke. It's really what cool. comes next. My final thought has to do with, it's part of a recommendation that everybody read Caroline Bergvall a lot. And another book that hasn't been mentioned is the book Drift. Mm -hmm. And at the center of Drift, we see contemporary refugees in a boat, not sufficient to contain the number, somewhere in the Mediterranean, adrift off of North Africa, seeking refugee status, asylum in Italy, and they're caught and they die, you know, because first of all, the state, various states are not trying to rescue them. And it's a, it's a tragedy. And her interest, going back to metal English, is in the crises and traumas and the whole question of survival of people who are displaced, particularly those who are drifting at sea, trying to reconcile that with her own and our, generally, sorry to generalize about all of us, but our interest in driftiness as opposed to settled and fixedness, mm -hmm. you know, the whole drift of language, and that's what she's into in that. So she's really interested in it. This poem is exciting to me in that vein because this is a poem which turns to a moment in Chaucer where he played with the rhetorical device of saying, I could tell you something that happened, but I'm not going to. So it's play. It's fun. You're reading this thinking, oh, how clever. He's got this, this really horrible circumstance, this funeral after this violence, and he's just playing with not telling you what it's, like, what it's, what it's all about. She then creates an anti knight's tale called The Knot Tale, in which testimony, the testimony of what cannot be said, because it's so frightening, because it's so traumatic, because it's so awful, cannot come out as language in any kind of conventional sense. So she's basically saying, you want to do this negative language thing? I'm really going to do it. And I'm going to want to, I'm going to vacate the whole rhetorical play so when I read nor how, nor how, nor how, nor who, I cannot say, nor can I say, I think about the survivor of a traumatic circumstance. Mm -hmm. And we all know what that's like, not being able to say what Chaucer felt humorously he could have said had he wanted to. So I think she's sort of upping the ante a little bit. Thank you all. This was so much fun. This was great. Thank you.